This Week on Waterways. Fifty years of the Wilderness Act in the Everglades and stormwater treatment in the Florida Keys. True leadership must provide for the next decade and not merely the next day. And that is the kind of leadership that this Congress is providing. Just over 50 years ago, the United States passed legislation that ensured that there would be places of solitude, places where nature was left alone, places untrammeled by humans. Signed on September 3, 1964, the Wilderness Act created the legal definition of wilderness and established a formal mechanism for designating new areas as wilderness. In my view, the purpose of the Wilderness Act was, was a, to create a piece of legislation that added an additional layer of protection for federal lands above and beyond the, the protection that was there. And the reason that that was done was to, to prevent the, the continual creep of urbanization and, and, um, and population expansion. It was to, it was to keep areas uh, as primitive a, 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 as possible. With over 60 drafts and eight tumultuous years of work, this monumental piece of legislation, when finally signed into law, protected just over 9 million acres of land. Today, there are 758 wilderness areas in the wilderness system encompassing 106 million acres, an area about the size of California. South Florida is home to four wilderness areas. Three are managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the JN Ding Darling, Island Bay, and Florida Keys. One is managed by the National Park Service, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Wilderness, designated by Congress in 1978 is the largest wilderness area east of the Mississippi River, covering nearly 1.3 million acres. The wilderness of the Everglades is very, you know, extensive. It's a huge area, um, and the Everglades ecosystem consists of a lot of different habitats uh, within that ecosystem. So uh, you can have areas of freshwater marsh, um, pine rockland, um, tropical hardwood hammocks, uh, mangrove estuary, open waters of Florida Bay, all of those areas uh, are, much of those areas are within the wilderness of Everglades National Park. So it's quite a diverse wilderness area. For Jimmy Saddle, as a botanist at Everglades National Park, one of his favorite ecosystems in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wilderness area is the Pine Rockland. The biggest draw to me to this area is the plant life. There are plants here that you don't find anywhere else in Everglades National Park. There are a lot of rare species that, uh, that may occur in a, a couple other places in Dade County, but nowhere else in the country. But it's also the complete lack of any signs of humanity and any noises from humanity with the occasional airplane maybe, but really there's nothing else out here but sounds of nature and the wind in the trees, birds. It's just, uh, it's really a great way to decompress. I think one of the things that people might get the impression of in wilderness is that it can be perhaps a, a very dangerous place or very exciting because of that. But in actuality, wilderness is, can be a very, you know, uh, relaxing, uh, refreshing, rejuvenating uh, kind of experience. Although most of Everglades National Park, nearly 87% of it, is designated wilderness, the parks developed areas and visitor facilities, such as visitor centers, campgrounds, the main park road, 
wayside exhibits, as well as most trails, lie just outside of that wilderness boundary. You know, one of the great things about getting into wilderness, a lot of people think that it's going to require this very complicated and time-consuming process. But one thing I've found is that um, from along the main park road in Everglades National Park, you can either walk or paddle a canoe um, and get into a wilderness area within literally five or 10 minutes and suddenly you're out of the sight of lots of people, car traffic, noise. Um, so it, it can actually be a fairly easy thing to do. It doesn't have to be difficult. In general, there are prohibited activities uh, within wilderness areas, and these would include such things as use of motorized, uh, mechanized equipment, um, uh, permanent dwellings, um, any kind of any kind of activities that would would represent a permanent um, footprint by man on the landscape. Most types of outdoor recreation are allowed in wilderness, except those needing mechanical transport or motorized equipment, such as motorboats, cars, trucks, off-road vehicles, bicycles, and snowmobiles. However, there are some exceptions. In Everglades, motorboats are allowed in the park's marine areas, where the wilderness is submerged and doesn't include the water column. It may seem a contradiction to be using a motorboat in a wilderness area, but in some cases, the water column is exempt from uh, wilderness and the bay bottom is designate, designated wilderness. This is to allow access into these areas where otherwise people would not be able to have the wildlife experience. Yeah, there are um, certain trails, designated trails within the park that go into the Everglades wilderness. Uh, that would include the Nine Mile Pond Canoe Trail, about 12 miles north of Flamingo along the main park road. Uh, it's about a five mile long loop um, through um, kind of an interface between freshwater marsh and mangrove environments. I mean, it gives people a great opportunity to get out and explore that environment, maybe see some of the wildlife out there, such as alligators, turtles, birds, fish, those kinds of things. Another great place in the park for viewing wildlife that falls within the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Wilderness is nearby Westlake. Uh, right now we can expect to see in Westlake this winter uh, a whole lot of coots, uh, a bunch of ducks, uh, particularly uh, ringneck ducks, American widgeon, uh, there's a few redhead around, and early in the season we see uh, blue winged teal. Biologist Tom Frankovich from Florida International University spends many days each month in the Everglades wilderness. His work with the benthic plants and algae in the lakes and estuaries of Florida Bay take him to some of the most remote places of South Florida, where there are few signs of civilization, but they're teeming with wildlife. When you come out in the wilderness, uh, take some time, uh, besides looking up and around you, look down into the water column and look down at the benthic vegetation that you may have growing down there. There's a whole different ecosystem within these benthic vegetation beds. This here is a uh, little piece of carahorn manii, a green algae that uh, carpets the bottom in parts of these lakes. And uh, this forms a big three-dimensional habitat, sometimes as, as much as a meter thick. And then there'll be shrimp, uh, small fish, and a whole bunch of life all within this car. So take some time to look over the side of your boat or canoe and check out the seagrasses and algae below. Wilderness, for some, may be a faraway, romantic, abstract notion. They are happy just to know it exists. For others, it is a place for refuge, 
a place to find peace. One thing is for sure, wilderness is a place for plants and animals to live and flourish as they did long ago. In Everglades Wilderness, wading birds can successfully forage without the threat of being hunted for their plumes. And panthers can roam without the dangers of speeding cars. While it is essential to set aside areas untrammeled by people, where natural forces predominate, it is also essential that some wilderness areas bear somewhat accessible to the public who support their existence. The more the public feels connected to these wild places, the more likely they'll remain wild. So there is kind of a balance between the, the purest beliefs in wilderness that would be, uh, in, entail areas that are completely undeveloped by people and say just a little bit of human activity such as the maintenance of a trail into a wilderness area that allows them um, a little bit more, slightly more comfortable and easy access into these areas. In addition to encouraging the public to visit and recreate in wilderness areas, sometimes special access is granted for researchers and scientists to use motorboats, ATVs, or even helicopters when they need to access these remote areas. In general, um, there are uh, certain human um, activities or human structures, you could say, that are allowed within wilderness areas that would allow people to explore them, such as trails, um, trail markers, uh, in some cases out in, um, you know, uh, marine or, or wetland areas, there might be markers that allow people to find their way, that kind of thing. But it's usually on a very re reduced uh, level. Trails and trail markers provide the public with easier access to these wild places. It also helps keep visitors safer. Wilderness explorers should always keep in mind that they are heading into remote areas and take the necessary steps to ensure a safe adventure. Being in the wilderness is an amazing experience, but you need to be prepared. The wilderness can be an unforgiving place, especially if you have problems or an emergency. Make sure you bring plenty of drinking water, extra dry clothes, and a first aid kit. A little planning will ensure a pleasant wildlife experience. Minimal provisions for a short half-day hike into the wilderness in Everglades National Park would require at least adequate water, a compass, a map, and an understanding of where you're going to go and how you're going to get back. Anybody that's going into the wilderness should Keep in mind that in many places in the park, communications by cell phone are not available. So don't expect to be able to make a phone call in order to, uh, in order to correct a mistake you made. It's, it's somewhat unforgiving in that way. When venturing into these remote areas, nothing is more valuable than common sense. It's a good idea to always explore with a buddy and to let someone know where you are going and when you expect to be back. These wild places are likely to remain wild if future generations attempt to infringe on the protected status of these lands. It would take another act of Congress to change or repeal the wilderness boundaries. That's a fact that comforts nature lovers and conservationists. I find that when I'm out in wilderness, I'm not necessarily always looking for things to see or even do out there. I'm just kind of walking. Uh, while I'm doing it, I often think about my life and my life in the modern world and how being in the wilderness helps to kind of temper all of the activity, sometimes the stress, the frustration of living in the modern world. The conscious decision to set aside areas of land from the progress of humankind may be a redeeming legacy for a materialistic society. On some level, we all recognize the importance of preserving these natural areas these special places. 50 years ago, when President Johnson signed the Wilderness Act, he made a statement that reverberates through Everglades' mangrove marshes, across the wooded pinelands, and into the pale sawgrass prairies. If future generations are to remember us with gratitude rather than contempt, we must leave them a glimpse of the world as it was in the beginning, not just after we got through with it.
It's just beneath your feet, beneath the roads you drive on. You rarely pay any attention to it. But when there are heavy rains, you notice. Stormwater. Have you ever really thought about what happens to rainwater when it goes into the drain on the side of the street or when it runs off the highway? Heavy rain from storms sets the stage for a dilemma where opposite goals collide. On the one hand, when the water doesn't drain quickly enough, the result is flooded roads, damaged property. On the other hand, when stormwater is drained too quickly, nearshore marine ecosystems can suffer. And EPA did some analysis of land basis charges in the Keys, and they estimated that at least 20% of the nitrogen loading uh, in land basis charges comes from stormwater, and about 45% of the phosphorus loading is attributed to stormwater. So that was definitely one of the, uh, the factors that uh, indicated that we needed to work to, to prevent and improve stormwater runoff. While South Florida and the Florida Keys are known for their sunshine, afternoon storms do pop up, especially during the summer wet season. The storms don't stay for long, but when the rain does come, it often comes in torrential bursts. Rain collects debris, oils, nutrients, and other contaminants when it hits the impenetrable surfaces of roads, driveways, and walkways. If stormwater is untreated, all the contaminants that are on the roadway that can be uh, pet feces, it can be uh, construction debris, it can be dirt, uh, so many different materials that are on our roadways, cans, bottles, it goes directly into our near shore waters. In the Florida Keys, a lot of the stormwater used to go directly through outfalls or pipes without any treatment for pollution. Drains would direct this water into pipes under the road, and those pipes just dump the rainwater and whatever was being carried with it directly into nearshore waters. It was obvious to the locals in the Florida Keys that this was contributing to the pollution of nearshore waters, and it was obvious to government agencies that something needed to be done about it. But there was also another pressing issue that needed attention, sewer upgrades and it made sense to tackle both of these problems at once. Back in 1999, the city had a very leaky sewer system. We had a lot of areas of untreated stormwater, and we had beach advisories that were posted all over the Keys. In the ensuing decade, Florida Keys communities built new and repaired old central sewer processing facilities, and residents began upgrading the lateral sewer lines that connected their homes to the main line. Fortunately, while upgrading the wastewater facilities, community planners were also looking at ways to improve rainwater treatment, removing pollutants and debris from stormwater before it entered the surrounding environment. What the city did, I think, was innovative in the sense that it was putting in a sewer system, um, knew that it needed to deal with stormwater issues at the same time, and basically um, built a sewer system and underlaid that system with a stormwater system at the same time. The city of Marathon tackled the two issues with one major public works project, saving the city effort and money. And while city and county municipalities are responsible for some of the streets in the jurisdiction, the state of Florida and Monroe County Department of Transportation are responsible for many of the main roads in the Keys, including US-1 and North and South Roosevelt Boulevards in Key West. Recently on Key West North Roosevelt Boulevard, arguably the busiest road in Key West, the Florida DOT installed state-of-the-art processing boxes that should help alleviate stormwater pollution of nearshore waters. Just down the street, Key West Utilities Manager Jay Guin observes his team cleaning out these baffle boxes that collect sediment and debris at the stormwater grates. Five full-time workers and two specially outfitted trucks are at the heart of Key West's stormwater program, performing maintenance on 1,170 catch basins, 75 shallow wells, 121 deep gravity injection wells, and 138 sediment traps. We utilize the uh, Vactor trucks both to, uh, to bring the water level down in the drainage system, and then the, uh, the drains, the, the various inlets have trash guards that we remove uh, any 
uh, cans, bottles, cigarette butts, uh, other contaminants that get in there from the system uh, and those are processed and hauled out as solid waste and we also uh, clean the baffle boxes to get out all of those sediments to uh, help protect our nearshore waters. There have already been signs that uh, some of the work that's going on, especially in Key West, you know, with the uh, reduction of the outfalls and the implementation of injection wells and stormwater treatment, that uh, may, may, may be reducing you know, some of the frequency of the beach closings in Key West. Uh, the uh, stormwater flow that was used to go to beaches you know, through stormwater outfalls without treatment, um, a lot, much of that is now going to uh, baffle boxes that provide retention and, and uh, treatment before it's discharged into injection wells. So that is definitely a positive sign. So if so much progress has been made with the stormwater systems, then why do residents of Key West and the Florida Keys still experience flooded streets after heavy rains? Well, one of the challenges in treating stormwater in the Keys compared with other areas of the country is because of our very low elevation, uh, it makes it challenging in a lot of the different neighborhoods in the city. Uh, areas where you could have a gravity system don't function in areas where you have a high water table that is so close to the surface of the roadway. So if you get heavy storms during times at, where the tides are very high, uh, it is going to be very difficult to mitigate the effects of flooding. Controlling flooding at high tide in Key West during raging rains is difficult, but Jay and his team are always finding ways to improve conditions on the streets. Many of the city's newest projects are designed to alleviate flooding conditions on Duval and Front Streets. A new outfall and larger storm drains on Duval will help remove rainwater more quickly from the roads. A new emergency outfall will be installed for the Simonton Beach area that will operate when flooding threatens property and poses a significant public safety hazard. In addition to controlling flooding, these outfalls will also have a trash screen, trash guards at the inlets, and a vortex unit to extract pollutants from the runoff. At this time, a lot of these projects are being implemented. They're in the, in the process of, of construction, um, uh, implementation and uh, it is expected by, by 2020 a lot of these projects will be completed. By the end of the uh, implementation we should expect to see uh, better water quality, uh, a reduced uh, frequency of algal blooms, uh, more water quality in terms of uh, uh, water clarity and less turbidity. While there is still much to be done, progress is being made by community governments. Recently, both the City of Marathon and the City of Key West won awards from the State of Florida for their work on upgrading the stormwater and wastewater systems. However, combating the negative effects of storm runoff on nearshore waters is not just a job for local governments. Everyone can do their part. You know, people can do things as basic as clean up after your pet. You know, don't just leave it in the street where it can go into the storm sewer. Uh, if you're washing your car, wash it on your yard instead of on the street where all the, the soaps and chemicals get into the storm drain. You know, make sure first of all your yard is not just full of stuff. You know, clean up your art, keep it maintained. Um, build berms, build swales and berms that uh, will contain stormwater on your property. And I would say on top of it, let's go one step further. It's something we really haven't even touched on. Um, you know, people constantly are fertilizing their yards. Um, they're applying weed killer. Um, I would say, you know, limited use of those products is, is essential. These combined efforts can make a big difference. From health advisories at the beach just a few years ago to today, building and operating award-winning stormwater processing systems demonstrates the commitment Florida Keys residents have for protecting the marine environment. Locals know that the health of the Keys economy and the health of our children depend on clean nearshore waters. As a team and as a city, we have done a fantastic job. You know, it's no one person, it's a organization and a uh, collection of residents that have identified this as a priority and uh, have 
made a commitment to future generations to be able to enjoy the water quality in the coral reef at the levels that uh, we are today and hopefully even better in the future.